Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Uh, we're going to meet a man who has written an astonishing book about the zero-hour contract culture in which we live. James Bloodworth's book is, um, uh, well, it's a, it's a work of art, actually, but it's also a work of profound political concern. And what is it we always say? What do you mean, always? I came up with it two weeks ago. If you're trying to run a slide rule over political decisions in this country at the moment, obviously in America this also applies, but focusing chiefly upon Britain, if you want to run a slide rule over what this government is likely or not likely to do in any given circumstance, ask yourself what the amoral billionaires would want. So if you ask yourself, what would the amoral billionaires want, and you turn our attention today to a decision from the government on whether it's going to slash the maximum bet on those fixed odds betting terminals, the so-called crack cocaine of gambling machines, um, campaigners want it to be set at £2. If you are asking yourself, what would the amoral billionaires want the government to do? Well, let's just say there probably won't be any surprises around the corner for you today. But I, I want to begin with a story that I, I... Well, where does one even start? I like days like today. Um, I had a, an amazing weekend. I had some astonishingly good news about all manner of, uh, of various career-related opportunities. And so I'm pretty much bouncing around the studio, which means I am cocky enough to undertake a subject that is possibly stupid. It may well be that either we are about to embark upon a period of prolonged radio silence from everyone except me, we'll probably break for some travel news, but otherwise this could be one of the most interminable monologues in the history of the interminable monologues that regularly punctuate this programme. Or we could be lifting the lid on uh, a catalogue of conspiracy theories that would make last week's conversations about Russia look positively rational. Or we could actually just take a few baby steps towards better understanding something that seems to me to be, in the great scheme of things, the most important story in town at the moment. Um, because 10,000 more people died in England and Wales in the first seven weeks of 2018 than was usual for this time of year. It dwarfs all such periods dating back to the Second World War in terms of percentages of total population. Um, that's astonishing. The health and social care system is, um, it is often feared that it's crumbling under the weight of the demands being placed upon it, as is, I'm afraid, the zeitgeist in Britain at the moment, the uh, concentration by vested interests on the media on immigration and attendant issues has completely ignored the inalienable fact that the pressure upon the health and social care system is caused by older people living longer, getting poorlier. That ain't going to change any time soon. Um, what is going to change, of course, is the ready supply of young, able-bodied people to work in the sectors looking after them, because we've told them all to clear off. But we're not going to talk about Brexit today. Cold weather, um, not actually hard to believe as you look out of the window in March, but it, it, it wasn't a massive factor during the first seven weeks of the year. It was a little bit warmer than normal, so that can't be it. Flu. A lot of flu around, but, you know, flu jabs are supposed to be easier to access now than they ever have been before. So I haven't got a theory. I haven't got a um, an expert yet. We, we'll speak to some doctors in the course of this hour. I might speak to Lauren, the uh, doctor who we met during the Junior Doctors Industrial Action, who's been tweeting furiously about this and quite rightly wondering why it's not getting more coverage. The answer to that, journalistically, I think, is because I, 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 I know nothing. Nobody knows. I might dedicate this programme to the memory of my old geography teacher, who, if you asked him anything that, that wasn't actually on the curriculum, because all he knew about geography was what was specifically on the curriculum. He hadn't got a degree in it or anything. He was a PE teacher. He tried to expand his horizons by, by, by doing geography as well. You'd ask him a question about something that wasn't on the curriculum, he'd say, don't know, nobody knows, don't need to know. That is, th th today's hour is dedicated to him. Don't know, nobody knows, don't need to know. Well, I want to know. 0345 6060973. We know, for example, that the last five years have seen extremely challenging conditions in terms of health outcomes. But what do you think, if you're a doctor or a nurse, explains this, or a statistician, or a, or a concerned patient, or just like me, a gob on a stick, 
What do you think could possibly account for the fact that 10,000 more people died in England and Wales than was usual for the time of year? Government health officials have offered nothing. It's, I mean, you want to put it in, in, in stark and emergency terms. It's a sharp rise in mortality. And maybe because it doesn't lend itself to easy politicking or to side-picking or to furious rows between people who don't really understand the issues, it's not getting the media coverage that you might expect. Um, we know, for example, that mental health patients in care are suffering in a way that they haven't suffered in previous years. That, that may have something to do with it. Waiting times, response targets are not being met due to a lack of resources. But there is a genuine air of confusion surrounding this that I am very... Uh, arrogance not quite the right word. I will go... It's, it's only a cockiness in, in so far as my faith in my callers and my listeners. It's, it's, it's no faith in me, this, because I, I've got nothing now, and it's 12 minutes after 10. My tank is empty. But I know an awful lot of people listen to this programme who have an awful lot of knowledge and experience in an awful lot of fields. And hopefully one of them can perhaps shed some light on this, even if it's just a little slither of light. Why do you think either from within or without the National Health Service, the first seven weeks of this year have seen a rise in deaths, a rise in mortality that nobody can explain, nobody could predict, and which dwarfs any comparable figures dating back as far as the end of the Second World War. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. And let's sort of treat it like a conversation today rather than a debate. I think we'll move on to debates in some of the other issues, but if we work together or if we were um, on the school run together this morning, this is the kind of conversation I'd want to be having with you. I know what you're thinking, thank God I don't work with James. His poor colleagues. I want to talk about Russia and the football. Why on earth does he want to talk about a massive rise in mortality rates? Well, the answer is obvious, isn't it? Is we're a lot more likely to be affected if there is an explanation for this, if there is some sort of underlying trend or tide here. It's a lot more likely to arrive on our own doorsteps, yours and mine, than anything that's happened in Salisbury or anything that's happening in Brussels today. Hear the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 973 is the number that you need. You can email james at lbc.co.uk. You can tweet at Mr James OB and you can, of course, text 84850. But it's phones, phone calls that I need in the first instance. Um, would undertakers have an insight? Uh, there, there, there was a measure of mortality, um, rises in mortality, were often measured by looking at the profits of undertakers. But they can't do that anymore because there's been an abrupt shift recently, presumably for economic reasons, for booking the lowest cost funerals. Do you believe that? Because people are making f smaller profits out of funerals. The, 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 the ability to track mortality by looking at funeral company profits has failed. The UK's second largest undertaker lost more than half its market value in the first few weeks of 2018. If, if you looked this weekend, if you're wondering whether I've gone a bit bonkers and why on earth am I talking about this today, sometimes we get it right when we smell something in the wind. The story this weekend, uh, led chiefly by The Observer in conjunction with Matt Fry's colleagues over at Channel 4 News about the Facebook harvesting, 50 million people whose information was accessed and harvested and manipulated in order to sway their votes. That story, if you listen to this programme, will not have taken you by surprise. Something on the wind that looks as though it must be bigger. Do you know what I mean? It looks as though this is an iceberg, only a tiny amount of which is above the surface and the massive majority of which language is beneath the sea. I just have a sneaking suspicion, and that's all it is, that these numbers and the reaction of some healthcare professionals are a lot more significant than some of the news coverage thus far would allow. But what do you know? Why? An increase. 12.4%, 10,000 more people dead than anybody could re realistically have expected or predicted. I want you to tell me why. It's, um, it's not the most obvious topic to be discussing today, but it could possibly be the most important story in the country. In the first seven weeks of 2018, over 10,000 more people died in England and Wales than is usual for this time of year. No official explanation from government health officials has been forthcoming, but the numbers bear comparison. Or, or rather um, uh, dwarf anything put out previously, any figures previously published dating back to the Second World War. What do you think is going on? And, and this is not a morning for qualifications and expertise necessarily, because the qualified people and the experts have stayed silent. Alice is in Northwich. Alice, what, what would you like to say? 
Um, I, I think the answers are quite uh, complex and varied. I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you that, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, my husband died uh, a month ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, he, he was in his late 70s, um, so he was in, you know, sort of a, a good age. Yes. Uh, at the same time, I, I'm a retired healthcare professional. Um, I think, uh, I do think underfunding of the health service is one thing. Although, having said that, I have to say that both the paramedic services and the, uh, our local hospital, when he got there, were absolutely heroic in their um, efforts. I'm glad you, you, I think we should all add that caveat. I've had some NHS dealings lately, not as profound as yours, obviously, but again, it, the individuals on the ground are, I think, holding the whole shebang together, aren't they? Oh, I, I, do, I do think that is absolutely the case. Um, I do think that um, there are other factors. I, because we were given special facilities, because he was so acutely ill whilst oh. uh, I was there, um, we, we came into contact, my daughter and I, with other people who were, uh, had relatives who, again, were critically ill. And so I was able to witness, I mean, I, I think so, broad brush, I think underfunding of the health service is one thing. I think underfunding of uh, public health is another thing. So just to pause you, Alice, if we're looking for government health officials to explain this, or indeed anybody in government to explain it, and if you're right and a large part of the answer is underfunding, they're not going to be queuing up to come on the telly, are they, and put that one out there? Oh, no, 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 it doesn't, it doesn't win any votes for their side, does it? Mm. What was the other thing? What were you moving on to before I so rudely interrupted you? No, 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 that's quite, that's quite <laughs> OK. Um, I, I think also, uh, I think there was a, a rise in, um, in, in flu. I mean, I don't know necessarily that flu was a factor for him, but I gather there was a, there was a problem arising flu. But I also think that the advice to um, older people... Um, on, on, I think I think people tend to think that they've had the flu job, they've had the job against pneumonia, that's it. They can go off singing and dancing and pretending they're 55, and and you can't. So I think that's one thing that it wouldn't cost the government very much to um, to rectify. And of course, that comes back to the public um, health. Yes. Um, but um, other people, uh, but, but to come back to the underfunding of the healthcare, you see, although. As I say, the paramedics were superb. He went into a state-of-the-art critical care unit, which, again, was absolutely superb. But other people were there also who should not have been um, there. Uh, my husband would not have been there if I'd been able to rely upon the fact of the uh, wards being fully staffed and operational at the weekend as, as well as during the week, which I knew they weren't. Uh, if I'd been able to think that he wouldn't die in a, a car park on a Friday night which I knew would be the case, uh, you know, that was another, uh, another thing. Uh, and there were other people there who had been on the wards and f f basically one has to say lack of cleanliness and lack of care. One was similarly dying of pneumonia acquired on the ward and uh, another patient, uh, though not actually going to die, had acquired a terrible disease called necrotizing fasciitis on the ward oh and, was, and was going to have to have um, uh, part of a lower limb uh, amputated. So, uh, just to, and you see, these things, can I just say, of course. before I lose my train of thought, Don't worry, go on. <laughs> because I'm not a young woman, <laughs> uh, these things uh, say to me that although the, the, the services, the critical services, the, the backup was not on the wards, are not adequately funded and staffed. But we keep, we keep the hearing basic, that. The basic backup care, which is required for the emergency services actually to be able to work as just emergency services. I will, I will wait um, to have your observations confirmed or denied by people working in the sector, but I think the picture you paint is irresistible. There is an idea that there are too many patients, too few doctors and nurses. A lot of the people we call patients are not in medical need. They're more at the social care end of the spectrum, but they have nowhere else to go. A lot of people are cross with me for not having said the A word yet, Alice. Do you know what the A word is? <laughs> Me. Austerity, but I'm waiting for well, people to ring in and absolutely. I'm waiting yeah. for people to ring in and tell me stuff. You can't complain that I haven't answered all the questions in my introduction, however long it may be. And that creates a, a situation where, as you said at the outset, there isn't going to be a gotcha answer to this. There's not going to be a jackpot answer that suddenly makes everything make sense. No. It's going to be a tapestry of, of, of different issues, and yes. you've you've covered a lot of them. Yes. Can I just cover one more to go back to the public health side? Um, there, there was poor weather. Pe 
but also people that other relatives of people critically ill that were there I, I couldn't help but notice uh, that they were over large shall we say and I thought well you're not going to get if you haven't already got diabetes and I, don't, and, I, and I do think again this is something the government could and should be doing something about well they do and they try to and then they get attacked for being the nanny state and public health England of course the organisation that would be addressing everything you've mentioned from flu right through to obesity when they get put in the hands of a, of a, of a sun newspaper journalist public health England get routinely maligned and attacked for suggesting that, that employees might want to start bringing in vegetable snacks instead of cakes and if, if you are doing the bidding of the amoral billionaires then you'll be trying to persuade readers of that newspaper that public health England is a bad thing with 5,000 members of staff but I'm with you I think that what's the point of having a government if it isn't trying to minimise incidences of potentially potentially fatal fatal diseases. Alice, thank you so much. I, I hope you feel you've had a good crack of the whip. You've taken me all the way to 26 minutes after 10, which is a bit of a record. <laughs> thank you very much. No, thank you. And, and once again, I'm so sorry for your loss. It's 26 minutes after 10. I gave you a clue to that a moment ago. In Corridor of FCA's off the marks early this morning. Why have 10,000 more people died this year than expected? I don't know, but when you cut the incomes of the poorest, you cut their services, you ration their health care so that emergency care surgeries, mental and social care are not readily available, there will be consequences. That would also, of course, explain why you don't find much mention of this staggering statistic in the Daily Mail or in the Sun or in the Daily Express or in the Daily Telegraph. One would hope it might have had a bit of proper coverage in the Times. But if this is, as many of you are suggesting to me, the inevitable upshot of government policies designed to cut, brought about during that desperate attempt by George Osborne and David Cameron to make you and me and people considerably poorer than both of us pay for the financial excesses of the banking sector, then this perhaps inevitably is where you end up. The number you need, and we need doctors and nurses now. Why do you think this has happened? A 12.4% increase on last year. 0345 6060973 is the number that you need. Alice's situation... Um, Quite a common one, I suspect, with this notion of there being too many people and not enough, what, staff, equipment, movement, emptying of beds, 10,375 deaths. A few of you are asking where the figure comes from. It's from the Office of National Statistics and it marks a 12.4% increase on last year's figure. What do you think is happening here? Either observationally and anecdotally, like Alice, or professionally from within the health service? Because this, this can't just, or maybe it can just be an anomaly. Can it just be something that gets explained away by, you know, exceptions that prove rules? You have a steady figure, a steady climb or decline, or a relative um, stagnant line, and once in a while it will be thrown completely out of kilter for reasons that nobody understands. I think, personally, that's unlikely. 28 minutes after 10 is the time. Coming up later in the programme, let me give you a heads up on what these stories are that have redrawn my attention to issues of trans. There's two. The first is... A men-only swimming session in um, Dulwich yesterday, Dulwich Leisure Centre in South London, was attended by two topless female swimmers who declared that they identify as male. Now, they're obviously being mischievous, but I think they're making a point that a lot of us um, struggle to see any particular problem with. The idea that if they simply say that they are men, then turning up in swimming trunks and, uh, by, I suppose, necessity, therefore topless, means that staff either have to turn around and tell them that they're not men, in which case the entire trans debate gets thrown into disarray, or they have to let these two topless women swim with the... Men. Um, they also used the male changing rooms before joining around 20 men for a dip. One of them came along with her husband. And, and I completely understand why. This is one of those rare areas where I haven't been able to pick a side and I'm not sure that I want to. Sometimes you stuff without links, without source material. And I, I think you're yanking my chain or I very um, uh, charitably conclude, not that you're trying to deliberately mislead me, but that someone might have misled you. So... Um, Nikki sent me a tweet a minute ago saying, bearing in mind that the homelessness czar seems to be utterly bemused about the huge increase in rough sleeping, I'm not sure that this government would admit to any influence over increased mortality. And I didn't read it out because I thought Nikki must have got the wrong end of the stick. But within a minute of that dropping into my inbox, Caroline sends me a link to an article which states pretty boldly, and this is from yesterday, so it must have been in the Observer, the UK's new homelessness minister has told The Guardian she does not know why the number of rough sleepers has increased so significantly in recent years. She did not accept the suggestion that welfare reforms and council cuts had contributed to the rise. 
We're living in, in um, Oceania, aren't we? Or hang on, are they the enemy? Wherever we're living, it's not very nice. And 10,000 deaths extra in the first seven weeks of this year. I hesitate to use the phrase tipping point, but perhaps in the absence of any explanation from politicians or um, healthcare professionals alike, I wonder whether this is actually the austerity pigeons coming home to roost. And those slightly excitable suggestions that Jeremy Hunt and his ilk were embarked upon a soft privatisation of the NHS demands that before you can do that, you know your Chomsky, you have to defund and demoralise until things are in such a state that politicians can carve them up and sell them off as a sort of rescue mission. I know that sounds a bit apocalyptic, but you have a listen and have a look around and see whether or not the people doing the bidding of the amoral billionaires have started trying to persuade you that the NHS isn't fit for purpose yet. Have a, have a think, have a read, have a look around. Any of them say, oh, no, it, it, it just doesn't, there's not enough to, we need to do this. Or they're focusing on um, stupid stuff, like I got given some bandages and, uh, and then when I got better, they didn't want the bandages back. Yeah, that really explains why 10,000 extra people are dead. Lauren Gavaham brought this story to my attention. Um, she's a consultant psychiatrist who was in this studio during the Junior Doctors' industrial action and uh, remains one of my go-to individuals for uh, early warnings of medical news. Uh, Lauren, I, I, would it be unprofessional of me to ask you what you think is going on? No, thanks very much for having me on today. And I suppose there's this whole sort of, you know, um, attention on Russia and Jeremy Corbyn's hat and everything. And meanwhile, <laughs> 10,000 people have died yes. um, in the first seven weeks of this year. Well, let's stop you there and begin by asking, as a consultant psychiatrist, as someone who's completed their medical training um, uh, up to this point, so you've been watching and working within the NHS for years and years, how shocking is that figure? How shocked are you? I'm really shocked, which is why I think I tweeted out that 10 times this morning to mm. all of uh, the people I know. So really, really shocking. I mean, it, there is a background to this. So the same professor, Professor Dawling and Professor Martin McKee in 2015 did some work from the Oxford group and actually found that in 2015, 30,000 excess deaths were found. And they linked that at the time, which they comment on a bit in this paper, to the fact that there had been such severe cuts in health and social care and obviously the, the austerity program being being rolled out by this government so it's really interesting because there's that background that was throughout 2015 and now of course we're only in march and already there have been 10,000 excess deaths what's key i think is that the government historically have sort of blamed an aging population and blamed influenza or a really big flu epidemic of course there was more flu this year but actually when you look at the figures the, the rates of flu within that sample are actually more or less the same as they were last year. So right. that's not to blame here. So then, of course, we have to think, why are people dying? And of is course, there no... I'm we, sorry to interrupt you when you're mid-diagnosis, <laughs> but is there no way it could just be an anomaly? I, 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 I don't want to sound like I'm clutching at straws, but statistically it's always possible. So I think, I think, of course, one wants to be careful about attributing sort of, you know, blame to particular factors here, and we don't want to do a Jeremy Hunt, but at the same time, I think there is a background. 30,000 deaths in one year in 2015, that's not an anomaly. I mean, there's something very serious going on there. And I think, as I say, we're only in March and 10,000 yeah. extra deaths already. We know that in January, hospitals were functioning at uh, sort of capacity of 100 plus percent. You know, the same limits are 85 percent we know there were no beds whatsoever you know we had 68 a and e department senior consultants in emergency part departments write to theresa may to say patients are dying on trolleys we know people were dying in their homes we know people were dying out on the streets i know you've been talking about homelessness so these are the sort of silent deaths i think that often don't come up until the numbers are counted um, and, and, and indeed crunched, and, and the, the, the yeah. A word, austerity, does seem to run under this and, and indeed run, run through this statistic in, a, in an irresistible fashion. I, again, I, I apologise if this is a stupid question, but how would, uh, on the wards, um, uh, mental health, your particular field actually is, is relevant yeah. here as well, because people with, with, with mental health problems aren't getting the care that they need, and that, that can yeah. see a decline in their physical health. But can you talk yeah. a layman and uh, all the lay women listening just through the impacts? Because it, 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 it's sometimes a little hard to see the causation. Do you know what I mean? We can cut sure. this and that, and we don't know whether that happens because of this. So, in terms of an overview of how slashing budgets impacts upon 
potential mortality rates? What would be the most obvious things to look at? So I think obviously we know the NHS is in the biggest funding squeeze ever, even though the government say they're funding it more. I think on the floor, I've just had a consultant orthopaedic surgeon actually contact me about this very matter. And his view is that actually in in January, you know, they were, you know, 50,000 operations got cancelled, elective operations. Yes. Now, of course, but these were supposed things, to be non-urgent, so you wouldn't necessarily leap to the conclusion that those people have, have therefore died early. Well, no, that's true, but I think there was a lot of um, treatment that was delayed and postponed because there, there just simply wasn't the, the space and the beds to treat people in. And I think on the floor, what's happening, obviously we're grossly understaffed in the NHS, and this is, for me... When weren't you? Huge. When weren't you, Lauren? When weren't we? Yes. Well, I think the 90s were perhaps a bit better. Okay. Um, You know, I think certainly from people who were in the NHS at that time. So it hasn't always been terrible. And I think when you look at the the figures, um, you know, 40,000 nurses short and 10,000 doctors down, what that means on the floor. And I know anyone that's been in the NHS will, will experience this. You see people running around like headless chickens. They can't spend time with patients. Yes. Of course, things like diagnosis. You need time. You need space to be able to do that job effectively, efficiently. And, of course, we're seeing the very extreme effects of this. I don't know if you've followed the case of Dr. Bauer Garber. I have, yes. The, the doctor that was, you know, um, convicted of gross neg- neg- negligence. And the, the feeling among many of your colleagues is that she was a, a, a victim of the system rather than a, a culprit of anything um, uh, bad or, or criminal. I mean... I think there were certainly mistakes made in that case, so I don't want to say there weren't. But I think what we're seeing, you know, she was on an understaffed ward. There was no trust induction for her. What we're seeing is the really raw effects of government underfunding for years, completely understaffed NHS now being sort of pinned on individual doctors and I think that's going to happen more and more Well we shall keep a close eye on it, hang on again I interrupt you with my final question which is, I mean the Chomsky uh, model you know, the, the slightly cliched line about if you want to privatise a public surface, first first you defund, then you demoralise. I mean, it fits the pattern here, but in your personal view, is this actually part of a process or is it just a, an end in itself, as it were? And they thought that they could cut stuff and they think that probably with the slavish support of Fleet Street they're going to get away with it. No one's going to join the dots on this one and if they do, they can blame it all on fat people or blame it all on, I don't know, immigrants mm-hmm. if they find a way to do it. Or do you fear, as a consultant psychiatrist working within in the NHS that there is a political master plan in place and it is all going from Jeremy Hunt's point of view swimmingly. Really, there's no doubt in my mind that really? there's a, a wider mm. plan. I mean, look, if you look at the history, just look back 30 years, this has been planned for many years and we're now seeing, you know, the CEO of the NHS inviting Donald Trump to come and look at services within the NHS. Theresa May doesn't rule out the NHS and US-UK trade deals. This is a disaster for our NHS. So there's no doubt in my mind that the, the, the aim here is profit and people don't matter. That's sadly what is happening. Well, well keep in touch. We'll continue to platform these issues as, as, as long as we have a microphone in front of us. Dr Lauren Gavahan, um, consultant psychiatrist and I think um, we say health service campaigner, although she does that bit in her spare time, with some very sobering thoughts. And, and that's why we're doing this topic today. It doesn't lend itself to a, to a cavalcade of contributions from qualified people. It's more a sense of looking at the view and wondering if it's quite uh, uh, quite as ugly at the second glance as it is at the first. And if you've been listening since the beginning of the programme this morning, you may, like me, feel that things, the more we talk about them, the uglier they get. Let me get rid of a few um, issues that, that you're suggesting might be part of it. As, as Lauren reminded us then, that the actual numbers for flu hadn't gone up by um, an amount that would account in any meaningful way for the overall increase in mortality rates. Um, It was not unusually high, so they don't know what the key reasons are. A lot of you are pointing out the cold weather, but this is oddly the first seven weeks of the year. The beast from the east didn't actually make his presence felt on these islands until after that period. So although we're all freezing our proverbials off this morning and were at the weekend, the first seven weeks of the year were not unduly cold. Whatever tricks your memory might be playing on you or whatever geographical anomalies you might have been shivering under. So it's not that. It's bigger. It's bigger than something that is explainable by an iota of evidence. And Lauren's explanation there, which should really worry us all, is that this is a a health service-wide, avoidable, politically deliberate decline.
And just to be really silly, or perhaps irresponsible, or possibly bang on the money again, if you were thinking of taking out private health insurance at the moment, how would the fact that 10,000 more people than anyone expected died within the NHS last year, uh, I beg your pardon, in the first seven weeks of this year, affect your decision? Where I, I suppose, inevitably, I feel a bit like I did when we first started talking about the Russian threat, and um, some people thought we were crackers. And we met with and introduced you to Bill Browder, who now is um, almost a permanent fixture in television studios and radio stations, newspaper articles, describing the kleptocratic nature of, of the Russian regime. But because I'm, I'm, my background's in newspapers, I'm always a little bit nervous going first or second, as it were. I like, I like, I, in this game, particularly, you wait until the newspapers have taken a line, then you pick a side, and then you have an argument. But with your help over the last few years, we've, we've managed to break out of that model. Um, and that's why some of the conversations we have are so fruitful, and it's why so many of our predictions about what might be happening in the future have come so true. And this feels the same to me. Again, this sort of constant caveat in 2018, I really hope I'm wrong. But looking at this statistic, the um, 10,000 rise in mortality in England and Wales in, in, in merely the first seven weeks of this year, and at the track record of the academics who've undertaken the research, who've analysed the figures from the Office for National Statistics, and at the dismissal of some of the more obvious explanations of it, and judging by your reaction as well, there is a notion that the government caused this. I saw a horrible exchange on Twitter last week between George Osborne and David Cameron where they, they, they were backslapping each other for... Um, uh, the, the economic results that they believe austerity has achieved so that Philip Hammond, I think, could say last week, couldn't he, that for the first time since 2010 the country wasn't operating on a deficit every year. Uh, the debt's gone through the roof. It's rocketed since they took over, but the, but the kind of incoming and outgoing columns have, have been balanced and they were b slapping each other on the back for this. And I looked at it and thought, man, man alive, are you, should you do this? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you tweet while you're stepping over bodies sleeping on the streets of the city where you edit a newspaper, Osborne? I thought to Cameron, having sold this country down the river on an epic attack of vanity, really, and entitlement, David Cameron is congratulating himself on a political achievement. And it was during the seven-week period, practically that saw 10,000 extra people die. All I've got at the moment, having applied Occam's razor and sought some expert advice, all I've got is that this is a result of government policies, chiefly with regard to cuts and social care. You may have something else. Glenith is in Croydon. Glenith, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, James. It's lovely to speak to you. I agree. Mm. Uh, this is a fantastic subject, and I'm so passionate. So, What's going on, Glenith? What do you think well, it is? I, I have been watching the population explode quietly and slowly over the last 10 years. Now, I cured myself of a huge bronchial problem. I had a bronchioscopy. I was on six pills a day. I couldn't walk down the garden. I, 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 I've been, been very fit. Yes. And doing all sorts of gardening. I still do. But I cured myself. Well done. I also got my husband virtually... Um, from a 38-inch waist to a 32-inch waist. Ah, you're I going for obesity. When you said... Ex come on yes. a no, I'm not. No, waistlines have no, exploded. No, no, it's not just waistlines. No. It's the immune system. OK. Now, I've been watching it. I've been reading about it. I, I, yes. I see we were in for a catastrophic... I am uh, delighted to, to be able to benefit from your expertise. I, I, I'm, I'm going to move you along, if I may, to the kind of punchlines, as it were, as, as, as opposed to the, to, the, um, to the introductions. OK. So off you go. Punch right. me. Right. Well, first of all, we've got people who are eating food. The food manufacturers are putting stuff in food. Yeah, but uh, then here's the thing. Why, why would that impact compared to last year? These are figures that no, they're, no, they're no, year on year, Glenith. What and, and, you're getting is yes. an increase in size. And that gradually, as people can't cope, the immune system fails. Now, if I cut myself, yes. it heals within, honestly, literally a day. Whereas before, it would take a week. Right. Um, I have proof of this because... Every part of... I'm 70. I go on an electric bike. In fact, my hanging about waiting for this call has prevented me from doing... You I could have done it while you were on your electric bike. Calls. We could talk while you're pedalling. Yeah, quite. Yes. The fact is that people need to get fit. You've seen this recent programme where they've got these celebra celebrities trying to lose... You're covering too much weapons. ground, Glenn. I can't keep up. I'm still on the exercise bike and you're talking about Les Dennis running a half marathon. What is your weight? 
Pardon? What is your weight? My weight? Yes. I've forgotten. Exactly. Hey, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in the shape of my life. I'm in peak condition. I'm 15 stone get lost. I'm about 12 you or 13 can't expect a government or uh, an NHS to keep you well if you don't keep yourself well. I do keep... Why are you picking on me? <laughs> I'm a picture of health. Because you're just one of many. But you're not accounting for the 12 months. You're accounting for a general and gradual decline, Glenith. You're not accounting for a, for a 12-month spike, which is what we're seeing here. I think everything you've said is valid and true, but it doesn't explain why it would have gone up by 12.4% in 12 months, does it? It is. There's a, what? There's a Professor Lustig in America oh. who is an obesity expert for children. Oh, yes. He's done programs. You only have to watch him. Okay. He calls sugar a poison. Yeah, I, I, you keep ignoring what I'm saying. This is all true constantly. It's not something that accounts for a 12-month spike, is it? No, no, it, it, no I disagree with you. What? How dare you? Have you listened to this program before? Getting bigger. No, if the population, two-thirds are... But over what's happened in the last 12 months? In the next six months. Yes, but that would be gradual. Up. OK. I, I, right, I think you're right uh, in a broader overview, but in terms of this particular spike, glancing at the clock, Glenith, and conscious that you haven't been on your exercise bike yet today, I'm going to crack on. But until the next time, Ange is in Bristol. Ange, what is going on? Oh, I love your previous caller. She was great. Oh. What a chuckle. And I love... Should I have kept her on for longer and, and, and shave some time off the amount of time I have for you? <laughs> Do you know, I've had such a chuckle. Good. All I want to say yes. is I think we need to look to our European friends. You They're know, not our friends to... anymore. They're our enemies. Oh, goodness me, does, oh. am I the only one that watches the news? They're a corrupt kleptocracy <laughs> EUSSR. Boo. Do you know, James, we are emigrating to Europe, but anyway, this very Sunday. But what I want to say is if you just look at hospital beds per thousand people, we have 2.7 hospital beds versus 5.2, which is the European average. Yeah. Germany has 8.2. If you look at CT scanners, 8 per million people versus 21.4. MRI scanners, 6.1 per million versus 15.4. How do you know all this? Are you, have you got a crib sheet? Did you prepare notes before ringing in? I think that should be yeah, encouraged. I've looked into this. Yes. I've looked into this myself because I was quite ill last year. Oh dear. Um, and I'm, I'm not all that old. I'm 35. But I had Spring bowel chicken. bleeding. Yes. Oh dear. <laughs> I had bowel bleeding, which is rather high. frightening. Ooh. And it took me, I know, I know, but rather frightening. And it took me a year to get referred on. So I got private health care, and it's fine. I don't have bowel cancer. I have another condition called endometriosis, which is fine. So you've been looking into the numbers. You've been looking into what's available. You've been looking into what is happening in other countries, and you think that we are being sold down the river by politicians who are still probably blaming it all upon the banking crisis and immigration. Yes, and I don't think we, we, we are able to look at our NHS objectively. Had you asked me about the NHS before I got ill, yes. I would have said, it's marvellous. Uh, How can you fault it? But until I needed to see a consultant, then I realised how, how difficult it is. We, we, we just don't have enough, uh, you know, specialising and don't have enough equipment for diagnostic medical care. Uh, but, but, but politically, this is deliberate. This is the thing that I, I, I struggle to fully understand. It also gives me a better insight into why some of Jeremy Corbyn's support is so passionate, because they genuinely believe, in a way that I just can't, that a Conservative government would imperil, endanger, and even kill people to make economic pro well to make profits to make to political points political capital i can't quite believe that but your analysis leaves me with little choice to conclude that either they are completely ignorant and blind and have no idea how these kind of cuts will impact upon health care or they don't care mm -hmm. I, I think it's almost like we're burying our heads in the sand and yes. we all know that it's bad but don't want to acknowledge it and just hope that we'll somehow you know, muddle through. You know, whether it's stoicism, uh, I just that, that, is, that is it. Well, this is post-Brexit Britain. I, I'm not surprised you're emigrating. Where are you going? You're not going to believe it. I, I am. Slovenia. Slovenia? I don't believe it. I know. <laughs> what, I know. What, what's happening in Slovenia? Slovakia. What's the not buzz? Slovakia. You know... Slovakia or Slovenia? No, I'm saying Slovenia. Slovenia. The one bordering, the one bordering Croatia. Yes, Very beautiful. Very important for the summer. Um, and, and we'll be in the Alps, but in terms of education and funding for young people, it is unrivaled oh, in Europe. Oh, days. I know I've heard it all now. I wish you the very, very best, Ange. Bon voyage, and I, I'm glad that the health situation has improved. This is, I think... Um, 
I think this is the most important conversation we've had in a very long time. Um, and remember that sometimes when we say slightly portentous stuff like that, we wait three or four years, and then we see, in the case of the Russia story, that we were right all along. I know that sounds a little bit um, conspiracy theory-ish, but I haven't heard anything yet that gives me pause or cause to believe that this isn't deliberate. I do miss time, time.